Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to New York University, Casa Italiana Zerini Marimò, for the presentation of the book Fotografia e Materialità in Italia, Franco Vaccari, Mario Cresci, Guido Guidi, Luigi Ghirri, by Nicoletta Leonardi. We take advantage of the presence of Nicoletta in New York to present uh, this book. And I asked my colleague David Forgash, who is a professor of contemporary Italian studies here at New York University, uh, and also an expert in photography uh, in, from a different angle, but definitely uh, is one of his fields of expertise. And David just published his book, Italy's Margins, Social Exclusion and National Formation since 1861. Uh, some of you might remember actually the photographic exhibit that uh, David uh, prepared uh, that somehow originated this book. And we had a concentrated version of the exhibit here at Casa Italiana uh, two years ago, I believe. You, you just got here from, from England. And um, so the book just came out, and we'll have chances to present it uh, at some point. Um, I was delighted to have a chance to welcome uh, Nicoletta also because uh, we had an exhibit only of one of these four great masters of Italian photography here, Luigi Ghirri. Uh, we had the exhibit dedicated to Il Profilo delle Nuvole. Shortly after his death, we were able to offer this unique opportunity to the New York public to see uh, first hand the images of uh, Luigi Ghirri, and that, of course, is a is, a, is an exhibit that remains for me very, very important. Uh, so any chance we have to talk about uh, this period in Italian photography is very welcome. Um, David has prepared um, with Nicoletta the presentation. Uh, you are in very capable hands. I just would like to remind you that uh, tomorrow evening we're going to have a presentation of uh, the new release in DVD and Blu-ray of Investigation on a Citizen Above All Suspicion. Uh, the Elio Petri 1971 film that won an Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film. David Forges is going to be again on the stage along with Antonio Monda that you see there. So if you're interested, come back also tomorrow for the screening of Indagine su un cittadino al di sopra di ogni sospetto. And for now, enjoy the presentation of Nicoletta Leonardi's book. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Is that working? Yeah. Stefano has introduced me, but he hasn't introduced, or uh, he's leaving me to introduce Nicoletta. So let me say a word about Nicoletta before I, um, we get into the presentation of this, of this very interesting book. Uh, Nicoletta Leonardi teaches art history at the University of California Florence Study Center. Uh, before that, she taught at the Academy of Fine Arts in, in uh, Torino, Florence, and Naples. She did her um, PhD in at UCL, University College London, where I used to be as well, although a different department. Um, and her research interests include the relationship between vision and technology in 19th century American landscape culture, um, pre-cinematic practices of immersive viewing and virtual traveling through images, uh, photographs as material objects, which we'll be talking about a bit now, this evening, um, and the role of photography as a tool for research and action within urban planning. Uh, she's edited several books on Italian photography, and her writings have been published in various exhibition catalogues. Most recently, um, the catalogue Concrete, Photography and Architecture, 2013, um, but also Franco Vaccari's Exhibitions in Real Time, um, 2007, uh, a collection in French, De l'Europe, Photographie, Essai, Histoire, 2007, and also masterpieces from the Guggenheim collection published uh, here, Guggenheim Publications, publications 2005. Um, she's the author of an earlier book, Il Paesaggio Americano dell'Ottocento, Pittori, Photography e Publico, published by Donzelli in 2003. And then this book that we're presenting today, Fotografia e Materialità in Italia, um, published by Post Media um, last year um, in uh, Milan. And she's currently edit working on a co-edited book with Simone Natale called Photography and Other Media in the 19th Century Towards an Integrated History. So um, let's focus on this book, um, which uh, examines the work, as you can see from the title, of four 
individuals. I don't think we can call them all photographers or straight photographers. Some are photographers, some are artists who work with photography. But they're all four individuals who used photography in unusual and challenging ways. Um, and in this book, uh, Nicoletta, you concentrate on the work of the 60s and 70s. Um, but in fact, all four of them went on producing work after those two decades. Um, Bacari was born in 1936, uh, Cresci and Guidi in the early 40s, um, and they're, they're still alive. And as far as I know, they had, but correct me if I'm wrong, they're still producing work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Giri died in 1992, young, he was only 49. Um, but, and he started using photography only in 1970, but he also went on to produce an important body of work through the 80s, um, the, the Italian Landscape series, the Polaroid series. I'm not sure if that was in the exhi exhibition here, but, you know, I mean, he, he was an important body of work until his death. So we're, we're going to look at some of the work quite closely of these four photographers in a minute, but I wanted to start by asking you why um, you chose to focus on, you know, to cut out this piece of time, the 60s and 70s. What's interesting to you about that period in particular. Okay, first of all, I want to thank David for the introduction and thank Casa Merili for having me here and also thank you for coming. Um, okay, so um, the reason for uh, I chose to work, uh, to limit my work on the 60s and 70s is that starting, starting from 1980, there is a big cultural change and social change and political change in Italy. And uh, I think actually we can even say that 1980, that, that specific year, is a, a turning point because 1980 is uh, the time when the wave of political um, protest that was, you know, that came out of 68 and was going on during the 70s can, came to an end. Uh, it's the year when the first repented uh, terrorist. Uh, Patrizio Pesci started actively collaborating with the police. So although terrorism was really still in action, both right wing and, and extreme leftist terrorism was active in 1980, it was the year in which the psychology, psychological and military compactness of terrorism, of the Red Brigades, started falling apart. It was also, very importantly, the year in which uh, private commercial television um, became a reality in Italy. Canale Cinque was uh, actually founded in uh, 1980, and uh, uh, it was the first time that uh, the Rai state monopoly uh, was challenged by uh, competition. And actually, Canale Cinque won this competition almost immediately because it gained uh, the rights to broadcast the Il Mundialito, which was this uh, very, you know, symbolical um, football uh, tournament in Uruguay at the end of 1980, in which the Italian national team was invited. So uh, it was the time in which, uh, for instance, um, uh, the, the Bronzi di Riace were exhibited for the first time, and it was the first mass uh, uh, the, the first exhibition that attracted a mass, an incredible mass of people. So, you know, there were many, many, uh, I mean, I could go on forever. It, so the 80s were a moment of big change and uh, of big depolitization. And of course, the arts reflected these changes. And as a matter of fact, during the, whereas in the 70s, in the 60s and 70s, many artists were actually politically engaged. They were working with you know, they wanted their work to have um, effects upon reality, real. I mean, they wanted their work to be real. They wanted to engage reality. They wanted to be to to engage social um, action. And, and in the 80s, we have a return to images, to you know, galleries, to the idea of. I mean, painting was a very big uh, art medium during the 80s, and the idea of a big, large, expensive picture uh, was predominant. And these, uh, in turn, uh, influenced the way photographers worked. So even Giri's work, Giri's work is completely different in the 70s and the 80s. In the 80s, he started doing working on larger formats, uh, larger format prints that he uh, printed with much, much care, which something which he didn't do in the 70s. He worked only in small format, and he was constantly saying everybody that he didn't care about how nice the picture looked. But in the 80s, he started to produce 
nice images, which wasn't at stake in the 70s and 80s, mm. in the 60s and 70s, when these artists were working uh, with photography as a material object and as something that is, you know, part of the materiality that surrounds us. And they weren't thinking about themselves as authors, I mean, as artists, but as, you know, aesthetic operators who were actually engaging reality and producing change. Okay, great. Thanks very much. I think, I mean, I think once we look at the work, we'll remember what's distinctive in some ways about that period. And I, I very much take the point that the eight, 1980 or thereabouts is a, is, a, is a watershed. Things change irrevocably, I think, after that. Um, each of the four photographers you look at, each of the four individuals you look at, have got a distinctive trajectory of their own. They're really four very individual and I think in very many ways very different figures. Um, so they can't be thought of as forming a group. They didn't work together, they didn't really interact. And yet you argue in this book that there's a common ground um, on which their work can be connected together and that ground is materialita. Materiality, you've already just used the word I suppose materialness, but anyway, it's not the same thing as reality. Um, it's not the same thing quite as the world outside. So I wanted just to try and get you to say something about the, how you understand the term. I mean, when I read the book, I was intrigued by this, and I, it seemed to me that there are two aspects to materiality. You might even mean two different things by it. The first, is, the first aspect is the concern that these photographers have with, the, with material objects, with things outside them and outside the camera. Um, in other words, to the world understood in, in its external quality. And you suggested, that at least in some of the work you look at, the photographer is concerned with these external things and the way they interact with a human observer. Um, um, a person in the photograph or um, the photographer himself. And these external things may be pieces of urban or rural landscape or they may be material objects. Uh, physical objects, for instance, in Guidi's photographs, you see uh, a tattered armchair or a television set or a piece of torn printed paper lying on a, a piece of waste ground, dirty ground, uh, or Kresh's photographs of household objects in the houses on the home, homes of poor families in Tricarico in the Basilicata. And I think one of the, the points of reference that you cite in the book here is uh, Arjun Apadurai, who's a a sociologist uh, who works actually now at NYU, um, who co edited a collection of essays called on the social life of things. And he said that things, material objects, have a social life. They have biographies. They have an existence in the world separate from human beings. Um, and there is sometimes a resistance or a tension between the object and the person. And I think that's one of the things you're trying to get at in the book. And I found that very interesting. So perhaps you could say something about that as we as we discuss the photographs. Um, the second aspect of materiality is rather different, it seems to me. It's the physical uh, or material process of photography itself um, and of photographic reproduction. So in this sense, materiality is the kind of the material um, fact of light passing through a lens or, and through a shutter onto photosensitive plate or, uh, uh, or film, um, developing and fixing the image, um, producing a print reproducing that print in a poster or in a gallery or in multiple copies in a book. Um, um, if you like, it's the world, it's the material world of the image itself, image making and the image as, as a social entity. Um, and um, in some of the discussions, you look very much at photographers, I think this is true particularly of Guidi and Giri, who are very much reflexively concerned. They're concerned with looking at the act of photographing, the material um, dimensions of the medium itself. So materiality seems to have these two different meanings in your work. And I wonder if you could perhaps just say something about the concept as you understand it, why you decided to put it up there on the, on the front of the book and, and how you think it might be a kind of glue that holds together these four, four very different people. OK, uh, yes. Um, <coughs> OK, so yes, materiality is uh, the stuff around us. So basically, you know, the objects that surround us and that we live with. Uh, of course, this may sound very simple, but it's actually, I mean, there is actually a very complex theory of materiality which has been formulated by, for instance, a British anthropologist and um, material culture scholar, Daniel Miller, uh, besides um, Apadurai. And um, mm, the idea is that of uh, getting over the traditional um, dualism between subject and object, uh, thinking of um, 
the uh, subject as something that the human being as uh, not the only protagonist in the production of meaning. The idea of materiality is um, that I use is related to this sort of theory. And of course, so these photographers engaged with materiality in this sense that they thought in, within, you know, that I think that the way that, that the theory of materiality developed uh, by, for instance, Daniel Miller, but also by Apadurai, really applies to their work. And uh, as such, they thought about photography as a material object, which, you know, is part of the materiality that surrounds us. So it's really not two different things here we're talking about. But I think you know it's more a consequence of their engaging, in, engaging materiality that led them to this idea of photography as something more than just an image, a representation, uh, but as something that also has a material dimension, which is the paper, which is the, the camera, which is the album, the photo album, you know, all the uh, material aspects of photography that uh, determines its meaning and, 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 and the way the materiality of photography engages the spectator uh, or the user or whatever determines you know, the meaning. So um, now in doing this, uh, what am I trying to do? Uh, I am trying to show that there is something, um, that, that there were people working in the 60s and 70s in Italy uh, who were not fitting the canon of postmodernism. And for this reason, you probably don't know most of these photographers, except from Giri, who was actually the one among these photographers who uh, is most, uh, who is closest to uh, postmodernity. And of course, what happens is that if you don't fit a canon, you don't exist, right? So during the 80s and 90s, especially ang Anglophone art history produced all this theoretical work and also you know, historical work about visuality. And as visuality is something, you know, that is uh, ideologically determinate, that is, um, that is um, that is something you know that uh, can uh, that that is um, something primarily controlled by the desire of the human being, the desires of the human being, and um, and along these along these. Um, idea of uh, visuality as, some, as, a, as an abstract, um, as, as something that's primarily an abstract and as um, ideologically determined. Um, on the other side, uh, there uh, has been a strong, um, you know, idea of modernism as something homogeneous, as something, you know, that has to, in a way, fit within a single canon modeled on the dichotomy of center periphery. So uh, the reason for you don't know some of this work, as probably most of this work, is again that because it didn't, didn't fit this canon, it didn't get uh, even looked at. And uh, now what I'm trying to do, and also here I'm indebted to the work of some scholars like uh, like um, uh, Elizabeth Edwards, for instance, who are working towards a, the construction of, uh, I mean, they, they, they pay much attention on local contexts and they work towards breaking up this idea of a unique, uh, homogeneous moder modernism. So, you know, something like this would, something like the work you're going to see. Uh, might have been has been interpreted as um, cultural delay, as uh, something worthless because uh, you know it was not uh, up to date. It was not uh, close to postmodernity. It was not something worth studying. And uh, on the contrary, I think uh, this is not a question. I mean, it's more productive to think about this work not so much in terms of cultural delay, but of cultural difference. And this opens up uh, you know, a, a scenario of very, very interesting work, which is actually today when postmodernism is pretty much under you know, attack, actually is very much up to date, if we want to you know, put it that way. So I think, uh, so I mean, this is uh, the rationale. OK, thank you very much. I think, I mean, I think what you're saying will probably become clearer when we see the photographs. So I suggest if we can now put the lights down and concentrate on the images. Um, and, um, we've 
Nicoletta sent me some good quality images from the book and we put them into a PowerPoint. And we haven't followed exactly the order in your book. You start with Vakari, but I thought it might be a good idea to start with uh, Kreshi, um, because he's the most, I, I think in some ways, the most immediately accessible of these photographers because he's the most political uh, in, in a more traditional sense, if I yes. can say that. Um, and um, start perhaps with this one, which is the, um, on, um, as you can see from the caption, this is a, a photograph taken at the demonstration. The demonstration took place in March 1968 in, in front of the Parliament building in Piazza Montecitori in Rome by people who'd been affected by the earthquake of, uh, this was the terrible earthquake of the, 14th, the night of the 14th and 15th of January 1968 in the, uh, the Terremoto del Belice in western Sicily, which completely wiped out four towns, Gibellina, Poggio Reale, Salaparuta, and Montevago. Uh, it killed 370 people, it displaced uh, about 70,000 people, and there were about 1,000 people injured. So it was a very, very serious um, catastrophe. And um, I think what's interesting about, if you can perhaps say something about this, is the format of the book, because uh, Kreshi went and took photographs of the demonstration, but he displays them in basically a concertina format. Is that right? The book is, is a fold-out. Oh, yeah. You can see from the dimensions there, it's 1.3 meters long when you pull the whole thing out. Um, and one of the internal it's photographs... It's 13 meters long. Sorry, 13 meters? Yeah. Or 1.3? Oh, you've admitted, oh, it's 13 meters. Okay, it's 13,000. Okay, 13 meters. It's very long. Okay, great. Um, the other thing that's interesting is the thing about double exposure that I think you explain in the book that Kreshi, um, it was raining and he reloaded in error the same film twice. So he'd exposed the film, he put it back in um, and did a double exposure. And he's got this rather kind of curiously ghostly superimposition, which he decided to keep. And it was a kind of automatic Rauschenberg print he produced. Could you perhaps say something about these two things, the, this unusual format and the, the, the particular kind of image that he, he ended up with? Yeah, Kreshi was trained, uh, trained as a graphic and product designer at uh, the School of Industrial Design in Venice, uh, which was um, a very um, up-to-date uh, place to study uh, in Italy. Also, the, the School of Architecture there was uh, very up-to-date, and so Kreshi, you know, really got the best of what you could get in Italy. Of course, he didn't study photography because photography was not a taught subject that back then in Italy in any universities, but you know, he got in contact with the photographic culture as well. So uh, the peculiarity of his work is that um, since the very beginning, he worked both as an artist, ex exhibiting his work in art galleries, um, museums, and as a professional. And he also became, and he was very, very uh, interested uh, in uh, making something real out of his work. So he was very political, very uh, much working on the field. And um, what, what's going on here is that he was uh, trying to uh, produce uh, an alternative press. He was trying to produce... Um, something that would be completely outside mainstream journalism. Uh, illustrated newspapers and magazines in Italy at the time were primarily uh, display, uh, you know, working with um, photojournalists uh, that were either you know, humanist photojournalists or uh, late neorealist neo photojournalists. And, and here we have a completely different approach. And uh, so it was, he wanted to produce something, a, a little book, a folded book that would circulate. Of course, he didn't manage to do that because th this was actually a self-production. And his attempt was also that of showing the people from not, you know, getting rid of any sort of pietism or sentimentalism, especially related to the, the, the Italian rural south during those years. I don't know if you're familiar with the photographs of Cartier-Bresson or, or even Franco Pinna, uh, you know, shot in the, in the 50s in, in southern Italy. So here we have a completely different uh, way of seeing these people. These are people who are empowered. They come to Rome by train. They probably, some of these people probably never took a train, but they're there. Women are there, children are there, and they are, uh, you know, demonstrating that they're, 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 you know, trying to get um, to, to to get something out of 
out of uh, the government uh, for them. And this was actually possible because uh, Valle del Belice was in the 50s a uh, center of experimentation of participative democracy. So uh, Cresci, who had already founded uh, um, among um, sociologists, architects, uh, and urban planners a, a collective called Polis in, in uh, Venice, he was already in contact with people uh, in Belice uh, who, like, like Danilo Dolci, who were actually, you know, experimenting uh, participative democracy. And so one of the reasons for he took these pictures is also that he was familiar with this, this reality and he, um, you know, was, he wanted to make it visible and, and to make it visible through a completely different point of view opposite to mainstream, as I said before, uh, you know, to the stereotypical representation that was so. Oh. Let's uh, just change and look at this one, which is another long format one. And again, this is, I'm not sure how long this one is, but this was a, a very long. Eight meters, eight yeah, meters. I always, I forgot. Okay, <laughs> you've got a, yeah, yeah, it's eight meters. <laughs> not, um, and am I right in thinking this is a mixture of photographs taken on the 2nd June yes. celebrations in in 68, so the Festa della Repubblica with various military parades and also found photographs, aren't they? Some yes. of these are not his own. Um, you can see top right there, the Ara, um, the Ara Pacis, which of course is a, a Latin inscription, but one dedicated to Mussolini in 1940. Um, and then below, posters for various Messini, various uh, right-wing um, uh, candidates in the elections. Um, so could you say something about this? Because this is rather different. This is really a work of montage yeah. and collage, isn't it? Yeah, no, the first one was a work of, was, was the product of, chan, of, of chance, yeah. which is important. I mean, w within the practice of these photographers, chance and accidents are crucial because it's a way of avoid direct control, you know, or taking a step back and letting the medium do what it does without control. This is a different situation. It's a situation in which we see the model of montage and especially the new avant-garde model of paratactic, paratactic montage, which is an image, you know, juxtaposed to another image, creating uh, some sort of a sort of cinematic sequence that has raptures. And uh, so what we're what we're seeing here is a way of a applying the new avant-garde um, model of collage to something that, again, Cresci wanted to uh, be um, a reality within uh, urban spaces, as you will see in a minute. So again, Cresci was, was constantly trying to apply avant-garde strategies, new avant-garde strategies to actual social, to, to social action, to, to, to the urban space. To, it was trying to continuously engage the spectators, the viewers into you know, a, a feedback process. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, I think that's what, what's particularly interesting about this one. And there's, I think, the next slide. Sorry, there's another one of the same. The one after shows this very well is that this is not just an experiment in, in a format, but an experiment in interaction with the public. Um, could you say something about this? You call it here an urban action that he yeah. carried out. This is, it. yeah, w w with the roles, he did several things. And uh, on, on, with the Esercitazioni Militari on August 29, 1968, he uh, did, uh, he carried out a urban action, which is one of the first, first urban actions in Italy, actually. I mean, because he saw P Pistoletto's um, urban actions, and he, of course, they were a model for him. And he also, um, he also, um, yeah, so, so what he did, basically, he, um, with these roles, he went around with a friend of his and uh, he just unrolled them. Uh, the role was unrolled outs outside the window of, his, of his, uh, the apartment where he was living and then it was unrolled in streets in Rome and it was also um, illegally hung on a billboard space uh, right beneath the advertisement of a military movie, of, of, of a war movie. So um, then what happened, and then his, his friend was helping him in this. Uh, it was an artist, Cosolo, who died shortly after, and they were actually recording 
the voices of people commenting on the work and those recordings are lost. And, uh, and then the police came and they questioned them. They took them to the, to the police headquarters and questioned them about what they were doing and then they were released. So the action was actually interrupted by the police. But yeah, so again, this idea of uh, you know, engaging the viewers and also surprising people and uh, uh, making their um, normal you know, path, uh, urban path, unexpected, uh, different in, in an unexpected way in order to activate a process of consciousness. Okay, uh, let's just now go back from just a little bit in time from August 68 to March 68. This is a series of photographs, um, um, sorry, a series of prints of the same photograph, is that right, taken in the demonstration of students outside the Faculty of Architecture in Valle Giulia in Rome in March 1968. So one of the sort of key um, moments of the 1968 protests in Italy. Um, and um, could you say something about this? Because there is a series of images that you've blown one up, I think. And this was used as a poster, I, I believe, by the left. This became a kind of iconic image of the 68 protests. So say something, could you, about this m multiple here and then um, the, how this image was um, put together by Kreshi. Yeah, again, uh, when um, w mm, Kreshi here wasn't um, using his own photographs, this is this is uh, film footage that some of his friends shot in Valle Giulia. So it's uh, from a 16 millimeter. And um, again, we have this idea of repetition of seriality and of paratactic collage, typical of the new avant-garde um, montage um, strategy. But again, here the difference is that Kreshi really actually, um, you know, um, engages reality. And so what happens here is that his work uh, wasn't conceived for an art gallery. It was conceived for public use. And so um, immediately after this um, poster was realized, um, because it was originally thought in the form of a multiple, so in the f in form of the poster. Uh, the flyer was made out of it, and it became, you know, the flyer that the students were using right after Valle Giulia to uh, to sort of symbolically, you know, represent not this image but the other one, the next one. <coughs> yeah, this one, this sort of contemporary pietas, you know, it's like the, the position of Christ. Is, you see two people holding a wounded student, two students holding a wounded student, and this image here immediately became, was immediately appropriated by the students, and uh, it was used as the symbolic image of uh, the, that, that, you know, the day, that disastrous clash. Another area, if I can just move on, because I'd like to make sure we cover all four photographers, but the, there's another area of his work we've already touched on, which is his work in the South. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned that he had, uh, in relation to that image of the Sicilian um, uh, Terra Mortati protesting, he had a different way of looking at the South and engaging people as protagonists from the photographers of the 50s. You mentioned Franco Pina, but you know, there's also Arturo Zavattini, there's all the people who worked with yeah. Ernesto De Martino. Now, I think one of the things you say in the book is very interesting, that he went to uh, Matera in 1966 or 67? 66. 66, just, so this is after the economic miracle and it's at a time when somebody going to the south from the north, he was born in Chiavari, I think, Provincia di Genova, so in Liguria, he studied, as you said, in Venice. So he's a northerner, he goes down to Matera and he sees a different kind of south from the one that had been described in the literature of, you know, millennialism in the 1950s, which is, you know, the left had said, get agricultural workers to do, you know, to occupy the land, have a kind of, you know, revolution agraria. And he sees that, you know, all the peasants have gone. They've all migrated en masse to northern Italy or to Germany, Switzerland, France. They're not there anymore. These towns have become depopulated. So a different kind of engagement with the South is required, also by photographers. And I think that's very interesting that when you sh show some of this work that he did, for instance, this series called Ritratti Reali, Real Portraits, you say that there is a series of triptychs which all have exactly the same procedure. There's a long shot of people with their objects around them, the kind of their household objects. Then there's a, um, a kind of piano americano, a closer shot. Um, and then they're holding their own photographs. And then there's just the photographs themselves. So there's this kind of boom, 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 zooming into um, a different kind of reality where these people are not really there 
in their abject poverty as objects to be observed in that kind of you know objectivist way of 1950s photography, but they're actually being engaged in the process of dialogue with the photographer. And I wonder if you could just say something about how Kreshi did this. Okay, so as I said before, in 1966, Kreshi founded an architectural collective in Venice, uh, along with other former students there who had just recently graduated. Uh, so there was a sociologist among them, Aldo Musacchio, and uh, an architect and an uh, urban planner. And um, the interesting thing is that these people, this group, uh, was hired by uh, local authorities in Basilicata, which means that actually the local authorities in Basilicata were clearly, you know, uh, I mean, not certainly backward. Uh, so they were they hired these young uh, professionals to draw uh, the um, urban zoning of Tricarico first and then of Matera second. Now, this was due to the fact that during the 50s, there was a disastrous urban zoning, uh, especially in the city of Matera, where uh, the Sassi were completely depopulated and uh, the people living there were moved to new apartment buildings in the outskirts of the city where people didn't know what to do and people didn't know what to do with these new modern houses where, where for instance, they had a bathtub. And so uh, um, urban planners realized that these people were very unhappy, that they were, they were growing tomatoes in their bathtubs because they, they didn't know what else to do with it and they, they didn't have a place to save their oil, their wine. It, it was really a, a total disaster. So basically these people, these young professionals were hired to uh, put remedies to this disaster. And uh, they did it through the model of participatory planning, which is a model of urban planning which entails the active, direct participation of citizens into the drawing of the plan and also into its application over time. So it's a kind of idea of urban planning as something that is nev never has an end. A an urban plan plan based on this principle is something that has to continually be readjusted through processes of, uh, processes of mediation you know, that occur after, uh, th through changes, through to, to, to when time goes by. So to be brief, <laughs> what happens, what happened here is that these kids, because they were just kids, uh, I mean, Kreshi's mother, for instance, was desperate because Kreshi was, be, was working actually in Paris before moving to Tricarico and he was making mille lire al mese. And then he decided to stop, to quit his job in Paris as a graphic designer and a, a very important um, uh, f um, graphic design uh, for a studio. And he moved to, to Tricarico and these this, this, uh, people were actually sleeping in the city hall and they were uh, working with people constantly. So the, the, this young people from northern Italy moved to southern Italy. They did, uh, you know, completely uh, changing their lives and also going in the opposite direction because all young people in southern Italy were moving towards the north. And what they found, as, as David said before, is a, a, a place where the rural, you know, the, the, that um, the rural areas were completely abandoned and. Uh, and there was um, no rural south basically left. I mean, very little of it left. And, um, and so what they did was, I mean, f the first problem they had was how do we talk to these people? How do we explain these people what urban planning is? They didn't, I mean, most of these people, most of the citizens barely talked Italian. Most of them only spoke the local dialect. So they needed to, ha to get a local historian, translate them, and they would uh, organize meetings with these people constantly in order to uh, draw the plan based on their desires, their expectations. And they also wanted to help them um, uh, to help them be able again to think about themselves in terms of future because only old people had remained in most of these areas and all young people had left. So what they did, for instance, in this case, is they went into the houses of people during um, you know, Sundays or when you know, they, uh, they would find someone there and uh, they would interview, they would start talking to people. And this was not only to take pictures of the places where they lived and what the, the objects that you know, were part of their everyday life, but also uh, to talk to them and to talk to them about their desires, to explain them what they were doing and to sort of ask them to participate and ask them to uh, be uh, 
be, uh, come to the meetings and so on and so forth. So uh, in doing this, they also were uh, collecting information about their desires, their identities, and their past, okay? And uh, so what they would do is they would go in, uh, Kreshi would go in with the local historian as translator, and uh, so they would engage this conver in these conversations about themselves. I mean, maybe they would try to get you know these people tell them that tell them their stories, and then show that they ask them. They, he always asked them to show them their pictures. And the interesting thing here is also going back to the photograph as a material object is that it's very important how the photographs were held. Not only what the photographs uh, depicted as images, but also how they were kept. How they were you know. Uh, kept as objects, and and so this is one of he, he, he produced about thirty uh, triptychs like this, and this is only one of the several ways in which this material, the materiality of photography, is really addressed in these photographs. And the other interesting thing is that with these photographs, they then made a show in the church of the village, and the people attended, uh, about a thousand people. And then at the end of the show, uh, these pictures were actually given as a present to the, to, to the, to the portrayed people. I, I think it's very interesting, although you don't say this in the book, this makes me think, just listening to you now, how much it changes one's perception of these images to have that explanation. Um, that if you didn't know that there was this whole participatory project, the way people were involved, you might think that this is a kind of objectivist, rather distancing sort of photograph. Um, you know, I mean, one could say, I suppose, the same thing about Walker Evans's um, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, which in some ways comes to mind here, that, you know, if you don't have the text by James Agee to contextualize that, those look a little bit like, you know, people distance in their poverty. And so I think, you know, it's very interesting that this kind of, um, this explanation of, the um, the politics of the project and the social engagement that was around it really does make one see these in a different way. I mean, I was the next example I think is even more striking because looking at these strange presepe figures of Joseph and Mary, um, you know, without knowing how they were produced, you know, you don't quite see what's going on. And I think again, it was very helpful in your book to have the explanation of how local citizens were involved in producing these. Yeah, these because figures. yeah. Because the triptych we saw before is actually a very famous, is part of the most famous uh, work by Kreshi, which has been then put in museums. So uh, historians of photography have not looked enough into the importance of the polis experiment and uh, the importance of what were these photographs produced for, which is exactly what I mean by photography, by the materiality of photography and the social life of things. I mean, if you only look at a photograph as an image, is one thing. But if you look, if you wonder why was this photograph made, what was it used for, what kind of social trajectory did it have, then, you know, other, other things come, come forward and, 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 you know, a completely different reality which is totally outside the as, as visual aesthetics is, is, uh, becomes you know, prominent. Now, this is another example. Here we have a photograph shot of a presepe, of a nativity, uh, that was um, made uh, with, uh, that was made by local, uh, by, by artists and, uh, and architects who had um, formed a circle, an, asso an associazione, uh, with the, um, along with the inhabitants of a very, very you know, depressed area in uh, Tricarico, and it was 1967. And uh, again, the issue here is uh, emigration. Okay, so people leaving, and you see... Is this 67 or 76? Sorry, 76. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so you see here Saint Joseph with uh, with um, with a piece of luggage, okay? And you see here Saint Joseph and Mary without a face, without an identity. So this is all about losing your identity, losing your future, you know, leaving and uh, and uh, and what's left. And uh, and so the material, the, so the, the the way this uh, happened is that uh, the people in the circolo, in the association, asked uh, local people to help them build this nativity, and uh, so everyone brought something, and they built uh, this scene. But then the local priest got so mad at the scene that during the night he completely destroyed everything. 
and uh, everything was gone, you know, the day after, and people were very unhappy, and, uh, and thank God we have these pictures. <laughs> story. Um, let's hop to the second photographer, Franco Vaccari, uh, who I think we'll see immediately is a rather different kind of um, artist. Um, here is um, two images from the, the book, uh, Popesie, uh, which you could kind of pun on poesia, so you could translate it, popem, poems, pop, popems, and it doesn't sound really good in English. Uh, anyway, um, and you know, this seems a very different kind of project. I think perhaps it makes sense if you put it together with the work he did using um, uh, graffiti and collage, because the concrete poem on the right that you can see is playing around with different typographic formats. These are almost like found phrases which are collaged together. Um, so there is a kind of continuity between these experiments in concrete poetry and this kind of photographic composition, it seems. Um, but it, 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 I would say, you know, it seems to me the politics of this are, are very different from what we've just been seeing with Kreshi. You know, this isn't engaging the public. This isn't about, uh, you know, working in a poor area. It's not about a project of social regeneration. This is, seems to me, much more for the art world. Um, is, is that right? And are we in a different kind of bit of the political here? Yeah, it's right and wrong at the same time. Because, uh, yes, uh, Kreshi was definitely, you know, working uh, outside the confines of the of visual aesthetics and he was working with photography as a material object that's capable of producing you know of challenging uh, political circumstances and even of producing change whereas uh, vaccari was more uh, of an artist artist uh, Kreshi was an artist but he was also as i said before a professional he was working as an urban planner and he was paid for working as an urban planner so uh, Vaccari was actually an artist working within um, the art system, and so it's a different story. But still, uh, what's very important about his work is his engagement with urban spaces and with the everyday realities of the Italian cities of the economic boom first, and then you know of the years after after that. And uh, we see this here, for instance. And uh, we see this in the work he did on graffiti, where he totally engaged uh, urban spaces and the everyday you know, realities of walking through an Italian city and um, encountering these situations in which, again, uh, you know, there is a lot of reality, there is a lot of meaning, there is a lot of social meaning, if you read all the words and stuff. And also, uh, he um, used graffiti as, he showed how graffiti um, were used as a way to resist to and, um, the, the, the Catholic code of conduct during those years of change, of social change in Italy. And also, he used uh, graffiti as a way of um, showing how people interacted with the new uh, images of modernity and uh, you know so also stereotypical images that were circulated through uh, the media especially through advertising so it's, uh, it's again uh, even though it was working and it, it wasn't really producing social change as Kreshi was still his, his work is important in terms of materiality because he's um, engaging the urban spaces. This one, uh, hard to read, this is a photograph of a poster that's been defaced, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Any comment on that, or do you? Should I, mean, just... I, I mean, I think uh, you know, gender issues here are clearly uh, at stake, and um, and of course, again, this idea of um, you know, sex, s sexual liberation, sexual repression, uh, the way images uh, of women were uh, stereotypical, and also the stereotypical act of you know tearing the poster right in that pubic area is, uh, I mean, speaks uh, by itself. Um, then there's a whole body of work that Vakari did, which is using photo booths. So these, uh, where you go in and you put a coin or some coins in a slot and your images came out. And could you just say something about, because this is a long project. He spent a long time doing these Esposizioni in Tempo Reale. Um, it started at the Biennale this, in 1972, but ran for, I think, a number of years. Is no, that... until 1974. To 74, okay, so a couple of years. But um, we've got a, a, some examples of this here. 
Um, could you, and sorry, ending I think with this one. So could you say something about this photo booth project? Okay, and so how it fits with particularly with your with your idea about materiality. Okay, yeah. So basically, uh, at, 19, at the 1972 Venice Biennale, the Italian pavilion was curated by two Italian art historians, Francesco Arcangeli and Renato Barilli, and uh, they organized the show entitled Opera or Comportament, Opera Comportamento, which is which means work of art or behavior. It was a question, okay? And um, so Vaccari was invited to the show, and uh, in his allocated space, he uh, just installed a commercial photo booth with nothing else. And uh, on the walls, uh, uh, he had a message for the for the viewers, for the for the. Um, Spectators saying, "Leave on the photograph. Uh, leave uh, on these walls a photographic trace of your visit," and it was translated in four languages. So the photo booth operated just like commercial photo booths work. So people who had to, who wanted to have their pictures taken, and you know, uh, um, accepted the artist's invitation, had to pay for it, just like in a therapy session, in a way. You know, so they had to comply to the rules that the, the machine was normally operated um, with. And, um, and so what happened is that um, people started uh, taking their pictures and playing with the photo booth uh, and uh, hanging their photographs on the walls. And so the walls of the Biennale very, very rapidly were covered up with photo strips of people, you know, doing all sorts of things. So it's, it's again, it, the, the, the ludic dimension is very important here. And uh, it's very, you know, very much part of this, of this uh, operation here. Because on the one hand, we have a photographer, an artist who works with photography, who brings the street into the erotic space of the Venice Biennale. He brings a photo booth, which is a very, very, you know, an authorial, uh, I mean, object. It's, I mean, photo booth. I mean, photo strips are, are photographs that we use for IDs. That they are the typical photographs that we don't like. That we don't. We, we're kind of reluctant to show to other people. And uh, and so you know, it was clearly a critic of the art system of value connected to the art object and of uh, authorship. So it brings in this photo booth and. Um, and um, and so the people start uh, taking their taking their pictures. They hang them on the wall, and uh, um, at the during the three days of the vernissage, he gave he handed out certificates of participation to the people who were t having their taking their picture, and uh, these certificates were formed also by detachable uh, card. That the, that the participants had to return to the artist with their address. So what happened is that shortly after, when the, after the Biennale, he collected all the photo strips and he produced a book. And the book was, uh, you know, some sort of photo collective photo album of the event. And but he had printing costs to cover. So he said, well, you know, he thought, well, probably the people who are depicted in the book are going to be interested in buying the book. So he sent them a letter to all of them, announcing the publication and uh, indicating the book, uh, the bookstores where the, the book was actually present. And in a matter of three days, the 500 copies were sold out and the costs were covered. So again, you know, if he was just working within the art system, he was involving people everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, and after that, because uh, the people, the, the, because uh, when uh, I mean the photo booth, he borrowed this photo booth from Dedem, which was a mainstream uh, photo booth uh, producer in Italy. And so the Dedem people, after the success of the Venice Biennale, were kind of you know, well, why don't we take advantage of this? And they 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 designed a poster that they were, they hang in all photo booths, saying, well, at the Venice Biennale, an artist uh, used these photographs, uh, I mean, photographs produced by this by, by the photo booth as uh, as art. So you can, but so why don't you come in and take your picture? It will be art, and we you know we'll make a movie and blah blah blah. And so Vaccari saw the poster and took action himself. And he said, well, you know, why don't I do this instead of you do it? And so he put a poster in all, he designed a poster, he put it in all, he got to use 1,000 photo booths all over Italy for a year. And uh, there was this poster saying that 
Franco Vaccari was looking for new faces for a movie. He actually wanted to make a movie made out of a continuous uh, shot, you know, of all the photo strips. So it was a movie, but it was not the kind of movie that the people who were taking their pictures were thinking about. And a special box was hanged by the photo booth so that people started like, <laughs> Uh, you know, taking their pictures and writing letters to him. You know, I have, I'm a nice girl. I have a very nice body, or you know, what, what, all sorts of letters and all sorts of uh, stuff. And uh, and at the end of of 1974, he collected thousands, thousands of photo strips, which are uh, shown here, where people were doing all sorts of things. Here we have people smoking and, uh, you know, and also not only black and white, but also color, which is very interesting because these are among the very first color photo strips <laughs> uh, in Italy. And, uh, you know, and, and then the old, the old story of color photography, of course, opens up uh, more uh, yeah. things to say, but... Uh, yeah, I think it's very interesting that having seen Cresci and uh, Vaccari together, they're different kind of photographic activists. I mean, I can see that both of them are trying to engage the public in a very direct way. Um, and I guess one of the things that would be interesting to discuss at the end if we have time is, you know, whether people feel there's a difference between the kind of engagement that Kreshi does, you know, with the, the urban action project of getting people to interact with these things in the street and the, the, the work that Fagari did, you know, starting at the Biennale but kind of moving out of the gallery space into, into public space. Anyway, but that, that I think is a very interesting area to, to look at. Um, we move on to Guidi, who's the third photographer who comes from uh, Cesena, is that right, in uh, Emilia Romagna, um, and very much um, photographs around this area. Um, a very different case again, I think, from the, the two we've been looking at. This is a photographer who's very much concerned with uh, photographing place, um, um, particular places in the landscape, uh, objects in houses and in interiors, um, but also he's concerned with, you know, the, the physical quality of the photograph, perhaps more than the other two we've been looking at, with the kind of the, the way that light um, plays within the image, where, where the light can actually start distorting s space and start making shape different. So it almost moves into an abstract kind of um, ex um, investigation of the photographic medium, it seems to me, and a different kind of project from the, the two we've been looking at. I think this is clear if we see some of the, the photographs in this series. Um, here's one of these interiors in a long strip. Here's um, this piece of ground with the torn paper on it. Um, this reminds me very much of the opening shots of Antonioni's Desetto Rosso, for instance, even though it's in black and white. Um, this photograph of a strangely sculpted tree in Gambettola. Um, and then this, these two, which are an example of the kind of more abstract thing, this window space seen in two different uh, takes with the blind up and down. Um, and then these very strange, almost uh, sort of Rothko-like images of a kind of, um, you know, um, deliquescent, you know, a sort of disappearing um, image of a window on a wall. So, you know, looking at it together, it seems a rather varied, varied body of work. And if you could just say something about it as a whole. Yeah, okay. So uh, basically, well, uh, materiality is really involved here as well. First of all... Um, the history of photography, if you think about the history of photography, the history of photography is primarily made out of images and authors. And the cameras are there only within technological histories of photography. Whereas uh, this uh, photographer here put the camera and his dialogue with the camera at the center of his work. So in the pictures of the, of the windows, for instance, what he's doing is, is sort of, you know, reflecting upon the camera and using the space he inhabits as a camera itself in order to point to this continuous dialogue of the photographer with the camera. And uh, it's, uh, it's very peculiar that he built his own cameras, so that he used all sorts of cameras and he uh, worked a lot based on... <coughs> chance. So, for instance, uh, he started with a 6x6 six six, uh, Raleigh, and then he moved on into more sophisticated cameras, but then parallel to these, he uh, used cameras built by him using uh, lens of photocopy machines, you know, all sorts of materialities at work here. And the way he also treated and still treats his prints, so to, to be clear, none of these prints are pr pressures. None of these prints are 
particularly large format. And none of these prints are, um, you know, well, um, the, 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 especially in, Giri, in Guidi's case, none of the work is actually completely finished. So here we have two prints in which he, uh, as you see, there is some writing on them, right? On top, there are numbers. He constantly writes on these prints. He erases his writing. He puts uh, information on it about the photograph, as in the first case. If we can go back to the first image. Here we have a photograph, which is the photograph that he, use, that he uses to tell the story of how he be, began uh, photo using photography, how he, he became a photographer. And the fact about this is that both the negative and the original negative and the original print is lost. This is a reprint. So the photograph says San Mauro in Valle, 1956, but actually, Underneath, he wrote something like, okay, this is a description, and then uh, he says uh, something about when the photograph was actually reprinted. And so the, the, the materiality of photography, the fact that, you know, you, the, the, the chance, the fact that you lose stuff, uh, the materiality of photography is something that's there because what is he doing is writing on the borders. So he's not just looking at the image, but uh, by writing on the borders of the print, he makes the 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 the, the paper the, the, that the print is actually that the, the image is actually you know uh, printed on visible, and it, it makes it a fact that is really important for understanding the social life of this image of this object. And so not only of the image, but also of the object. So, so, not, so he points to the fact that it's important to think of photogra photographs not just as images, but as material objects. And also he points to his own biography, to his own time. So there are you know, layers of temporal uh, things going on here. His personal biography, his encounter with this photograph, his re-encounter with it after years, and, um, and it, his dialogue with it. Yeah, and it's, I think, an interesting example of where, if you like, the project of art photography meets the ordinary uh, world of social photography of everyday, you know, family snaps and portraits. It's, um, you know, I think a striking example of that. Um, I think because we probably need to come to a close soon, let's, let's look at these last two images. Sorry, this last image by Guidi, which is very enigmatic, <laughs> very fascinating. These, this couple's sort of obscured by this architectural feature in, uh, in Treviso. Could you say something about this one? Yeah, he uh, the, start, so basically what, what's um, going on here is that he started taking pictures at night in very, very dark areas using a flash. And he wasn't even looking at the view inside the viewfinder. When he, when he, so he started taking pictures based on, again, chance, you know, accidents, um, unexpected encounters, because he didn't know, <laughs> because the light was, it was, you know, it was a dark area, so he had no idea what he was taking a picture of, or he had a very, I mean, he had an idea, but he didn't have like a clear idea of what, uh, what would have come out. And so again, as in the case of Vaccari, where the camera becomes the author in a way here, again, we have an author who's di who's, who engages in a dialogue with the camera, where the camera, you know, takes in a way control up to a certain point. So it's no longer the author who's completely controlling what is shooting, who's not like framing the world through his gaze, but it's an author who takes one step back and sort of, you know, puts, uh, starts a dialogue and, and accepts, accepts accidents or things that were not uh, forecast by him. Let's uh, move on to Giri, um, who I think, as Stefano mentioned, is although I didn't know there was a Giri exhibition here. It was before I came. Yeah, um, and I think he probably is the best known of these of this group, um, certainly outside Italy. But um, he, you know, if you don't know his work, this extraordinarily striking series of kitsch images of Italian scenes 
Um, this is a kind of double take. You see St. Peter's, but it's actually a model of St. Peter's in uh, L'Italia in Miniatura, the theme park just outside Rimini. Um, and then just behind the cigarette stubs, you can see Michelangelo's um, Dave, David printed on an ashtray. Um, and then there's this collection of, again, sort of kitsch images of Italy. So um, it's a very different body of work and I mean perhaps could you could you just draw out again for us what the how the the category of materiality works uh, for you okay. in, yeah. in Giri? Yeah. Um, Giri uh, tried very hard to be a postmodernist. He really wanted to but he, he didn't manage basically and uh, this is because I think I mean this is you know one of the one of the arguments of uh, my um, book is that um, in Italy, um, there was a, a strong um, existentialist and phenomenological inclination that prevented these artists, these intellectuals, to think, to think about reality as something that only lays within the linguistic or conceptual uh, models we uh, adopt to interpret it. So uh, Giri, you know, read Baudrillard, he read all the right stuff, and uh, he... Uh, sometimes didn't really get what he read because he was a self-taught. And he was, uh, it was uh, you know, but he was a very, very, he was, a, I mean, an incredible person. And uh, he did, um, I mean, he did also a lot in terms of uh, promoting Italian photography. And, um, and so what happens here, I think, is that his um, photographs, as much as his writings, especially up until 1980, 1981, are uh, souvenirs. They function the same way as a souvenir function. And uh, all his pictures uh, can be read, of this period, can be read as souvenir, souvenirs and as, uh, and his, I mean, his, the body of work he produced can be read as a collection of souvenirs. Um, so what is at stake here is uh, Giri thought about modernity as something that's, uh, you know, uh, creating alienation and, uh, of course, you know, all the, all the, um, all the usual worries. And uh, he thought, uh, he wrote on several uh, occasions in his writings that reality is something that exists only in representations. But then immediately after writing this, every time he turns back and says, but I want to go back to reality, but I want to go, but my work is about going back to uh, our memories, our past, and about uh, really, you know, fighting this and uh, the possibility of uh, going back and getting back in touch with our origins and with our identity. So it's this uh, dichotomy, this continuous, uh, you know, uh, this continuous dichotomy between these two uh, polar um, uh, points. On the one hand, we have his idea of reality as a permanent copy, so this idea of reality as something that you can no longer experience. But on the other hand, we have his longing for origin, which is constantly present in his work. And his uh, in infancy in rural uh, Emilia is constantly there. His longing for childhood is constantly there. His longing for you know post the post-war period of reconstruction, which is when he was a child, is constantly at stake in his work. So um, again, it's a postmodernism that speaks a local accent. It's a postmodernism that never gets rid of this idea of, as Latrada used to say, uh, looking at the world through eyes full of love, and uh, and. Um, so basically, and uh, you know, the strategy that he adopted, if we can move one, we'll go to the, get to the ashtray, yeah, here, I mean, here we have a very typical strategy of trompe l'oeil painting, uh, the Chatourne. It's uh, the photograph has been cut off just like Flemish paintings, uh, Flemish, uh, you know, uh, trompe l'oeil paintings. And um, so again, we have this idea of um, creating a representation which is an object at the same time and overlapping the, 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 the object, the, the reality and representation, which is exactly what is at work with the souvenir. Okay, so I hope I was clear. Yeah, thank 
you very much. I think we can. And another thing he did was he, he operated this strategy also through a continuous passage of scale, so from the miniature to the gigantic and vice versa, which is again something that we always find, for instance, in toys or in uh, childhood games. Right. And this is wonderful. I mean, it's the 365 yeah. prints of different... Uh, yeah, this is a miniaturization of the sky. It's a good point on which to end. I mean, perhaps just, just to draw together what you've been saying, I, I, I think it, it's probably pretty clear that these are four very different. They are. Sorry? Oh, sorry. I think it's pretty clear these are four very different individuals. I wouldn't want, and I don't think you would want, to pull them together into a single frame. I think what's exciting about their work is they are going in these different directions. I also think that this is probably shown to you how much this does belong to another era. You start off by saying how 1980 was a watershed. And I think that going back and seeing the kind of impegno of somebody like Cresci, those extraordinarily powerful images of the Sicilian demonstrators that we started with, or the 1968 protest, or the kind of, you know, also strangely dated experimentation with, you know, leave a trace of your passage, that kind of 60s conceptualism, um, is a different era. You know, I think after that came what you said. It came the end of... Uh, the kind of protest movement, the end of the, the left, really, the beginnings of that cultural transformation that we associate with the 80s, you know, with the rise of private television and, you know, ultimately the rise of the, the centre-right in Italy. And this is another world. Um, I, it's dated. <laughs> it's, it's a kind of a, a, a strangely foreign country now. And I find that my students are very interested in the 16th and 70s precisely because they want to know what happened before that cultural transformation. So I think one of the, you know, really valuable things about your project is you situate the, those two decades very precisely you know, within the art world. You talk about the connections these people have with American pop, for instance, the impact of the, you know, the, the pop artist shown in, in the 32nd Biennale in 64, Rausch and Bergdine. You know, these people are being seen in Italy for the first time and they impact on, on contemporary art. Um, you show the impact of politics on art. Um, and then, you know, by the 80s, it's all gone. It's just gone up in a a puff of smoke. So you've kind of reconstructed that for us. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm, there may be questions. I hope there are some questions. And I'd very much like to invite you to interact with Nicoletta about what she's been saying um, about any of this. Yeah. Um, so at, at the beginning, you said that you were know, focusing on the 60s and the 70s because there was this materiality that was present to be looked at, but nobody was looking was, was there any, because of you know all the social movements that were going on, feminism, uh, autonomia, um, gay liberation, all these other kinds of political movements, were there any ideologies or anybody in the academy or anybody looking at materiality at the time as a theoretical concept? Uh, not within art history or, I mean, yeah, in a way, yes, but not uh, as much as they're doing it now. So, um, of course, what's, of course, uh, people who theorize materiality now uh, take, I mean, do it uh, also thanks to the legacy that the 60s and 70s left as, because otherwise, I think, I mean, that experience was important for these people. And um, so, in, in a way, you know, but within art history, especially and the history of photography, these issues have very rarely been uh, addressed. Uh, Michael Baxendal was among the first uh, scholars. I mean, this is also. I mean, the interest for, towards materiality is very much uh, a reality in, among British scholars because um, Mark cultural material material marxism and and then anthropology you know uh, is a, a big uh, um, cultural presence there um, and, and in fact as a matter of fact Baxendal was a british art historian social art historian Other questions <laughs> you can't have two <laughs> Well, if nobody else wants to. Um, OK, well, thank you very much. I mean, I think I'd, I'm really very pleased to have had you here. And I, th I think if I can say what's striking about this project, and I think it came out very well from your 
explanation of the project is that it's important to put these images back into a context. Um, you know, materiality isn't just realism. There's a complete difference between, you know, the neorealist project in the 40s and 50s and this. This is much more self-aware. It's reflecting on the medium. It's aware of the kind of conditions of production of photography. It's not a kind of naive objectivism, yeah. and that's what's important about it. And I think you bring that out extremely well. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you.